Hello, I want to talk today about the relative orientation of the camera pair, uh, the fundamental matrix and the central matrix. So we are now moving on from using a single camera to using two cameras. How do two camera systems look like? So this here is an example for a camera pair. So this is a standard stereo camera. That means we have two cameras two physical cameras which are rigidly attached to each other and which um, take images at the same point in time so that, can, that we can work with pairs of images taken from different locations. And this is an example for a so-called stereo normal case where both cameras are looking in the right direction and we just have an offset along uh, our one direction of our two images. But that's not the only example for a camera pair. It can only be just one physical camera, which is moving through the environment. So I take one image from here, move my camera over here, and take a second image from the other side. This would also be something that we would qualify as a camera pair and for which we want to do estimation. And so just to remind you of that, a camera pair is not just a stereo camera. It can be also one camera that moves through the environment or two cameras which move freely through the scene. So when we talk about a camera pair, we are basically talking about two configurations from which images have been taken and we are using those two images to estimate something. For example, what is the relative orientation of my two cameras when they were taking their images? And in the lecture today, we want to look into the relative orientation. What can we say about the relative orientation? And then look into two very essential um, matrices, the so-called fundamental matrix and the essential matrix, which are two matrices, one for the uncalibrated camera and one for the calibrated camera, to describe the relative orientation um, among those cameras. So we start with describing the relative orientation of the camera pair. Um, so how can we describe the orientation abs in an absolute manner and in a relative manner? And so when we think about orientation, so what are the orientation parameters in a camera? And these are the parameters which are involved in our mapping x equals px, something that we have done for the single camera case when we're describing the mapping, how a point from the 3D bolt is mapped onto my camera image. And the question now, um, if I have two cameras or camera pair, either two fixedly mounted cameras or a freely moving camera, how many parameters do I actually need to describe that mapping? So how many free parameters do I have? And you can think about this. How does it work for a calibrated camera? That means a camera where my, cali my calibration matrix is known and is already applied so that I can directly measure my points in my camera coordinate system. Or how would that look like for an uncalibrated camera where I don't know my calibration matrix? So how many parameters do I need? So if I have a calibrated camera, the only three parameters are the orientation of each camera. So where is it looking to? So the heading information, as well as the position information. So where is the, um, uh, the projection center of every camera? So this is three for the translation, three for the rotation for the first camera, and then three more for the rotation and for the translation for the second camera. So we have three plus three plus three plus three. So we have 12 parameters for the calibrated camera, which are two poses, two position and heading information. For the uncalibrated camera, we can assume that, or we may not be able to assume that the camera has the same calibration matrix um, because it could be two cameras um, or uh, like this the stereo pair and both may have a different calibration matrix. So again, if you remember, the calibration matrix had five parameters. Um, so that means we have 10 more parameters for the uncalibrated case because we have two cameras. Each camera has five additional parameters. So it's 12 plus 10, so 22 parameters. In the first case, we have 12 parameters, six plus six, and here we have 11 plus 11 uh, parameters that we need in order to describe the parameters of the mapping that is generated by the camera pair. So 12 and 22 parameters is the ma theoretical maximum of parameters that we uh, can use to describe the camera. So the key question is, can we actually estimate camera motion without knowing the scene? It's kind of the first key question that we want to answer. 
So if you think about the single camera case, we exploited here knowledge about the scene in order to describe where a camera is. So if you think about the um, projective three-point algorithm, there we used three control points in the environment in order to estimate the, motion, the position and orientation of one single camera. And um, if we think about the uncalibrated camera, we had the DLT where we needed five control points to estimate the 11 parameters for one camera. But all this exploited knowledge about the scene. We were assuming we know points in the environment. And here we want to go a step further and ignore what we know about, that we know anything about the environment. So we do not want to know specific location of 3D points in the world. We just want to work based on the images that the two cameras provide us. So either we have two images, one from camera one, one from camera two, or we have two images, one taken from the camera at point one, camera moving through the environment to a different location, taking a second image, and we have those second images. And the question is, can we describe the movement of that camera in the scene? This is one of the key questions. And for that, we first need to ask which parameters can we actually obtain if we don't have any knowledge about the scene and which parameters we may not be able to estimate at all from our camera. And um, one thing that you, you may have observed, it's hard to estimate scale from camera information. So if you have one single image of an object, it's hard to say how large the object actually is. So we as humans often can estimate the size, but this is basically something that we have learned. So our system knows how large certain objects are and then assumes a certain size or relates different people with each other. But it's actually from the image itself impossible without having any information about the scene to estimate the size of the object that we are looking on to. And so you can even create images which generates a false impression for us humans where you have objects which are typically very small and just scale them up and it's very hard. You can easily confuse people that they are assuming the size of the objects to be wrong. So we already know that from a single image, um, scale is something that we cannot easily estimate. And this also depends uh, from the fact that we don't know how far the objects are away. That the camera is basically a direction measurement device which tells us in which direction which light intensity has been measured. And it is actually similar for the case that I have um, two cameras observing the same scene, there are certain parameters which I she cannot estimate. And um, there's actually one parameter for the cali calibrated case that is hard for us to estimate if you just think about the relative orientation of the camera. And so we can nicely describe it with this figure. So all the variables which have a single prime refer to camera number one and all the, op the variables with two primes refer to camera, camera number two. So this is the location of camera number one and I just fix it for now. Let's say this be the center of the reference frame. So I'm not caring about where this camera is globally. I'm just looking here um, saying I want to express everything with respect to camera number one. And then I can place camera number two, for example, over here, looking into this direction. Um, and then we see a box, let's say this is the box that we are seeing, but we have no idea about the size of the box or even the knowledge that it is a box. And so if we have a point X over here, there's a certain ray in our camera uh, image number one where we see this point, there's a certain ray in camera image number two where we see that point. Okay? Um, and if we would know, uh, would have perfect knowledge about the scene, that would be sufficient to allow us to estimate where that camera number two actually is. The problem that we have, however, is that we do not know anything about the scene, right? We want to get rid of the assumption that we know what we are perceiving. So what we can do now is we can shift, actually, the camera along this line to this position and then observe the object so that the same, beam, uh, the same ray, same pixel that has seen this object here still sees the object over here. But the object is simply larger. So by moving the camera further away, we can actually generate the same physical image if we would scale up the size of the scene. And this is an important insight that we cannot obtain the full translation and rotation of a second camera with respect to a first camera. Because if we move the camera along the scene, we could generate exactly the same image just by scaling up and down the scene. And either we know something about the scene such as a scale, then we can actually nail it down. But if we don't know anything about the scene, 
it's impossible for us to say where that second camera is located along this line over here. So this means we are not able to estimate the global, the, 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 the scale, so how far the second camera is away from the first camera. And something that is obvious that we also do not know is where this camera number one is located. So in the explanation so far, I just said, let's fix this and as the center of the reference frame and express everything with respect to this camera. Then I'm missing the scale information. But what I also do not know is where are those objects in the scene or where is this camera in a global reference frame? So the global translation and global rotation is kind of lost. But I can actually express this everything related to um, the camera. But well, now the opposite thing, what I can actually estimate of my 12 parameters. So again, overall this were 12 parameters. It seems the global translation and the global rotation I cannot estimate. So three of those parameters, uh, six of these parameters are already gone. Three for the translation, three for the rotation. And I can't resolve the scale information. So where I am along this line. This is again one parameter I cannot estimate. So from these 12 parameters, it turns out that seven parameters I can actually not estimate. What I, however, will be able to do is estimate the remaining five parameters. Where is the second camera with respect to the first camera except of the scale information? This is something I also cannot resolve. So what we can do is we can estimate the rotation R of the second camera with respect to the first camera. This gives us a rotation matrix and these three parameters I can fix. What I can also fix is the direction of this solid line I've drawn over here. And this is basically a line on which the second camera can slide. And this is basically a direction vector B connecting the projection centers. The direction of this vector I can estimate, so two parameters are fixed. But what I do not know is the length of this vector, the distance that those cameras do have. So this, I don't know how far it is away, I only know the direction along which the second camera is being located. And this again is directly related to the scale of the scene and the orientation of the first camera. Um, so the global scale rotation is because I have no knowledge about the scene. I do not know where those objects are in the world. So to summarize this, for my calibrated camera, I would need 2 times 6 equals to 12 parameters to describe the orientation of the camera pair. So with a calibrated camera, we obtain so-called so angle-preserving mapping or an angle-preserving model of our object. So without further information about the scene, we can only estimate 12 minus 7 equals to 5 parameters. What we are not able to obtain are the 7 parameters, translation rotation of the scene or of the first camera and the distance between the two cameras. Right? So this is something that I cannot obtain. I only can obtain these five parameters. So there's basically a similarity transform, three translation parameters, three rotation parameters, one scale parameter that I actually cannot resolve. This holds for the calibrated camera, so I know the calibration matrix. And the resulting model that I get if I build a model of a scene giving these two calibrated um, cameras um, is a so-called photogrammetric model. And this is a 3D model of the scene, but which is only known up to a similarity transform. So I'm missing the global rotation and translation, and I'm missing the size of the object, so the scale of the object is not available. And that's something that we refer to as the so-called photogrammetric model. If I want to put the photogrammetric model into the real world, so that means fixing this similarity transform, the scale and where it is in the real world, this is then something which I call computing the absolute orientation. This I have to distinguish from the relative orientation. So in this lecture here we'll talk a lot about the relative orientation. Where's camera two with respect to camera one in terms of these five parameters for the calibrated camera that I can actually estimate? If I then want to do an absolute orientation, I need to have knowledge about the scene. I can't do that without. And this knowledge can, for example, be provided by the location of three 3D points in the world. If I have three 3D points in the world, I can compute the absolute orientation and estimate this similarity transform. Um, in order to put the photogrammetric model into the real world.
So what is actually needed in order to estimate the full 3D model of the scene? We just learned three um, 3D points are given, but there are also other opportunities that um, or options that I can have in order to do this. So consider you have two images, one image over here, one image over there, and you extract points in both images and you can triangulate uh, those points. Let's say an aerial image as is shown over here. So this is the uh, part of the roof. It's identified in both images. This is one of those points over here. So what do we need to know in order to estimate where this point is in the real world? And then estimate where the cameras are in the world. So what I either need, I need to know three, location in locations, um, oh, three locations of points in the world. Right? So if I would know the location of three different places in the world, I can actually build my photogrammetric model and then compute the absolute orientation of my photogrammetric model. What is also sufficient to know if I would know both camera locations, right? That's obvious. If I know both camera locations uh, with um, the heading information as well as the um, position information, I can just make a simple triangulation estimate where the point in the 3D world. And then assuming there are no errors involved, I can actually estimate the 3 location of the point directly. And what, but what I also can do is I can actually estimate if I know the location of the camera number one only and I know the lengths of this vector here B or called baseline vector between the projection centers of the camera. I can also build the photogrammetric model from the two cameras and then locate it because this location gives me the six degrees of freedom that I don't know and the length of this vector gives me the seventh, seventh degree of freedom about the scale so that I then can recover a full 3D model about the world. Um, other things are if I know distances in the, in the real world, then I can also use this information in order to build a 3D model. This was so far done for two calibrated cameras. So how does it look like if we are looking for uncalibrated cameras? So in uncalibrated cameras, um, I'm talking here about cameras without nonlinear errors. So we are only taking these 11 degrees of freedom per camera into account. So five for the calibration matrix and six for the extrinsics. And then we have a straight line preserving mapping, but not an angle preserving mapping. So everything which is a straight line in the real world stays a straight line, but the angles um, between straight lines um, are not preserved in our image. And so the object that I can reconstruct from that are also objects um, that are, can be um, reconstructed up to a straight line preserving mapping. So that means I have a um, projective transform that I cannot resolve. And a projective transform in 3D is a 15 degree of freedom transformation. So it's basically my homogeneous transformation matrix, which is a four by four matrix. One parameter is gone for the scale um, of the homogeneity. And so I have 15 parameters left, and this is my projective transformation. So that means from the 22 parameters that I have, 15 I cannot resolve. That means there are only seven parameters that I can actually resolve giving a pair of images. So for the uncalibrated camera I can only estimate seven parameters compared to the five parameters of the uncalibrated camera. That means in contrast if you want to compute the absolute orientation for a calibrated camera pair we need to have at least five points in terms of 3D locations because then we have three times five equals 15. So the minimum number of control points that I need in order to create an absolute orientation for the uncalib uncalibrated camera, so under a projective transform in 3D, is actually 5. So minimum 5 points I need. This also means that if I have a pair of an uncalibrated camera, the maximum number of parameters I can estimate describing the relative orientation are those 7 parameters in here. So seven parameters I can actually extract from knowing um, just correspondences between images, but not knowing anything about the scene itself. So in terms of the summary on this orientation, so you have the calib calibrated camera. Every camera has six parameters, just the intrinsics, uh, extrinsics, sorry, just the extrinsics. So X, Y, that, your patrol. If I have the camera pair, I have twice the number. So six times two gives me 12. 
So we have the relative orientation, so what we can actually estimate without knowing any knowledge about the scene are those five parameters. This is kind of where is the second camera with respect to the first camera in terms of the orientation of three and two with respect to the direction vector, um, with, uh, which is the direction vector of the projection centers. Lengths I can't estimate, therefore I have only five and not six parameters here. So we have remaining seven parameters for the absolute orientation. That means I need to have at least three 3D points in order to fix those seven parameters for computing the absolute orientation. For the uncalibrated camera, we have 11 parameters per camera, so 22 for the pair. We know everything up to a, to a projective transform, so 15 parameters can't be fixed. Seven can be fixed just by looking to correspondences between images, so that we need five control points at minimum to fix the absolute orientation. So this first part allowed us to quantify what um, properties of the orientation are kind of relative, which I can just estimate between the two cameras, and what are absolute where I need external reference information. And so those numbers are very important information, and we will deal a lot in the subsequent part on how to estimate these five or seven parameters for the um, relative orientation. So relative orientation plays an important role because this is the information that you can actually estimate just from using a camera. So if you take a camera and you move a camera through the world, you can actually best estimate the parameters of the relative orientation without knowing anything about the scene, just from using your image information. So in the end, this works by finding points in two images, which are identical, but I have no idea where those points are in the world. And just by knowing this correspondence, point correspondence information, we can actually estimate or recover the motion of the camera, at least this five degrees of freedom for the calibrated camera and seven degrees of freedom for the uncalibrated camera. Okay, so let's um, look into the geometry a bit more and see how we can describe certain properties in there. This will lead us to the so-called fundamental matrix. So we are starting now with the uncalibrated camera, so assuming we have no calibration information, and we will look into something which is called the coplanarity constraint for the straight line preserving camera, that means for the uncalibrated camera. Okay, so let's again assume we don't know anything about the scene, and we want to start, let's say, having perfect orientation, uh, so we don't have um, any issues that we don't see a point perfectly, so there's no, measure, no noise in our measurement. And we have one camera which is sitting over here, and the second camera which is actually sitting over here. And they both observe a point X in the world. Okay? So the question, if I have this information, what do I know? I do know that the points end at exactly the same point in the world. So this is what I assumed with that um, I have the, uh, everything is, is running perfectly here. So there's no noise in this process. So I, those directions vectors, um, I want to go from here to here and here to here, I know they will intersect in the point X. So this means that the rays that I'm shooting from the individual projection center, from projection center of camera one and projection center from camera two, will meet in a point. That means there's a plane in 3D where those two vectors lie within that plane. And that is something that I can actually exploit. If I know that those two vectors lie in a plane, I also know that the vector connecting the two projection centers will actually lie in a plane. So I have three vectors in 3D that lie in a plane. Okay, and this is something which I um, can express in this form over here. So what is written here is a scalar triple product, um, which is equal to zero if all the vectors that I have in here lie in a plane in 3D. So I have once a vector which goes from O to X prime. So this is the point O X prime is the vector going from uh, the projection center of the first camera to the point in 3D. So X O prime. I have the vector going from uh, O prime to O double prime. This is the basically baseline vector I have here between the two cameras. So where it basically is from the projection center of camera one points to the projection center of camera number two. I have this one, and then from O double prime to X double prime, whereas X prime and X double prime refer to the same point X in the 3D world. 
And so this is a direction vector, this is a direction, or this is a vector, this is a vector, and this is a vector, so they're not necessarily um, unit length. Um, and then what this expression tells me, what well, the scalar triple product is equals to zero means that these points line a plane. So what is the scalar triple product, um, or in German, Spatprodukt? Um, this is an operator which takes three vectors as an input, and it can easily be defined um, by the cross product and the, um, the dot product. So it's basically the cross product A cross B, the resulting vector um, with the uh, scalar product um, with the vector C. And it's what it basically computes is the volume of the parallelopit um, that is spent by these three vectors. So you have these three vectors A, B and C and basically the volume that we have here. And you can also directly see that if the vector, so A cross B, what it basically computes is a vector that is orthogonal on A and B, right? And so if I compute the dot product between this vector which is orthogonal on A and B where C is zero, that means C must lie in the plane spent by A and B. And this would mean this volume is zero. And this means that all three vectors lie in a plane. And this is exactly the result. If A, B, C equals zero, that means that the vectors lie in one single plane in 3D. Okay? So what I've been doing here, I'm writing this constraint down. And this is something which I can write down without having any knowledge about the scene. Just by knowing the fact that the, both cameras observe the same point in the environment. Right? So what we need to do now is to replace this O prime, X prime, O prime, O double prime, O double prime, X double prime with entities that we know that relates that to the properties of our camera. Okay? So what do we know about the cameras? We know that those cameras project 3D points into our image. So, and this works with X equals PX. So again, every prime variable depends, is related to camera one. The double prime variables are related to camera number two. But we have the same point x over here because we know it's the same point in the 3D world, although we do not know the 3D coordinate of that point in the world. But we know it's the same one, that's important here. And then we know that the projection matrix of the camera number one is k prime, so it's in the calibration matrix of the first camera, the rotation of the first camera, and the translation vector of the first projection center, and the same thing for camera number two. So two cameras. With ha which have potentially a different uh, projection vector. So this is how I can write down the um, projection matrices. And just as a short reminder, um, this notation over here means this is a three by three matrix, this is the identity matrix over here, and then we have the parameters for the um, translation vector in here in X, Y, and that coordinate. Okay, so now we, what we wanted to look is we actually wanted to look into those vectors. What are those vectors? And these are vectors which I can compute taking into account the um, calibration matrix of our camera. If you remember correctly, the um, calibration matrix inverse multiplied with the uh, pixel coordinate that I obtain gives me the direction vector expressed in the camera coordinate system of my, uh, in the coordinate system of my camera, okay? So I need to now go slightly a step further and also put the orientation of camera one and orientation of camera two into account if I want to put this into a global reference frame or at least in the same reference frame of the two cameras, right? So because these are direction vectors, so if I would um, write down here, I have my image coordinate, I'll multiply from the left-hand side the calibration matrix inversed. Um, this would express me the direction vector but expressed in the camera uh, coordinate system of my camera number one. And so I need to take the inverse of the um, rotation matrix into account into let's call it a normalized um, uh, projection vector so that it will be the same for both cameras if I do that for camera number one and camera number two. So then I know that no orientations are involved anymore so that this point must be equal just to the, uh, to the translation and, and the ideal projection um, that is generated by having my camera in the 
um, at the location of my um, projection center of camera one and I multiply it with the 3D point in world coordinates, right? So um, that we obtain the point projected from this point, we can actually compute the direction vectors that we have in this normalized projection. And we can do analogously exactly the same thing for um, the second camera, where I put the pixel coordinate of the second camera in there, take the calibration matrix of the second camera and the rotation matrix of the second camera, both inverted, and I obtain the same direction vector um, for the second camera. And this gives me this O prime, um, X prime, and O double prime, X double prime, the direction vectors for my cameras. And then I have two of my vectors in my triangle already defined. And uh, the same I can do with my baseline vector. So my baseline vector is just given by the difference of the true projection center. So this is the direction uh, from one camera uh, projection center to the second projection center. So what I now can do is I can take those expressions, so the baseline as well as those elements here, and can put them into my original equation. So here again I had my um, scalar triple product which resulted from the coplanarity constraint, um, my three vectors. So this gives me the direction vector um, of the first camera shooting towards the corresponding point. This is my baseline vector and this over here is my uh, normalized uh, direction vector from for the second camera. And I know that three elements should be zero. So then I can take the de definition from the triple scalar product. So I have the cross product between two vectors and the um, multiplied the dot product with the uh, or scalar product with the um, uh, with the third vector. It should be zero. And what I then can do, I can rewrite this so that B cross product X can be written with a skew symmetric matrix. So again, a skew symmetric matrix is a matrix which has a special form, where, which I can use to express the um, a cross product through a matrix vector multiplication. So nothing changes in here. It's just a different way for writing B uh, with, the, with a cross product. So just to kind of illustrate you briefly that this is actually correct in case you, you do not know how this uh, skew symmetric matrix work. So the question is, why is this correct? And then we can simply show this if I have vector b1 and I multiply it with a vector x uh, with a cross product. So what I obtain, again, if I have the cross product, so for the, um, for the first coordinate, I get my um, b3 times x2 and b3 times x2. Just check for the correct signs that I have over here. And for the second coordinates, it's um, x1, b3 minus b1, x3, um, which is over here. And for the um, third, third part, I take x1 times b2 minus b1 times x2 uh, plus, sorry. So this is um, the, the corresponding expression. And I get exactly the same result if I use a screw symmetric, screw symmetric matrix, which is has b1 sitting over here, minus b2 here, b3 over here, zeros in the main diagonal. Um, and I multiply this matrix with this vector. So just, for the, just to see that the first line is correct, um, what, what would happen, I multiply this vector over here with this vector over here. So zero times x1, no x1 pops up here, minus b3 times x2, minus b3 times x2, plus b2 times x3 plus b2 times x3 gives me this expression. And I can repeat the same thing for the two other lines. So um, um, uh, a, a skew symmetric matrix is always a matrix um, which has zeros on its main diagonal and the elements down here are the negatives of those elements up here. And um, so the, where the, so it's a matrix which is equivalent to the negative of its transposed. And this can be used to turn this cross product into a matrix vector product, which is quite nice because then I can actually write down things as a chain of matrix multiplications and don't ha do not have a cross product in between, although it is actually equivalent. So what I can do is, just to go back, 
I can actually write this expression in this form over here. So I turned this triple spark product into a vector matrix vector equals to zero equation. Okay? Now let's take this equation here and continue with this equation. So um, what I now can do is I can again fill this normalized projection vector and put in my rotation matrix and my calibration matrix and the pixel coordinate in again, right? So I can take this expression and put it over here and could do the same thing for um, uh, the second coordinate. So let's just expand this expression. So it's x prime transposed. So this is the actual pixel coordinate that I have. The inverse transpose of the calibration matrix of camera one the inverse transpose of the rotation matrix of um, my camera one, which is actually the same than the rotation matrix of the camera one because I invert it and transpose it as long as it's a rotation matrix, the result um, is, is the same. Then um, I have my screw symmetric matrix, I have my uh, rotation matrix of camera two inverted, the calibration matrix of camera two inverted times the pixel coordinate of my camera number two, and this should be equal to zero. And now what I'm doing, I'm taking this whole thing over here in the middle. This is a matrix. And this is a matrix which contains a product of five matrices here, but I can condense them together. So it's a three by three matrix that results from this. And I simply give this matrix the name F. So this thing is subsumized in F so that F has the following form. And I can simplify that a little bit so that for the rotation matrix, the inverse transposed, uh, so again, inverse is equal to the transpose, and if I transpose the matrix twice, I get the original matrix. So this is just the rotation matrix, and R inverse is equal to R transposed. So this is my resulting definition of my matrix F. And this matrix F is the so-called fundamental matrix. And the fundamental matrix of this form describes all the parameters that we can actually estimate for the relative orientation of one camera with respect to another camera. And the elegant thing about it is that we can express the coplanarity constraint so that the constraint that all those vectors lie in the same plane can be written down as x prime transposed f x double prime equals to zero. So this means if I have two um, pixel coordinates of points which um, which refers to the same point in the real world. I know that x transpose times the fundamental matrix times x double prime um, gives me, should, must give me zero. So this must be zero if that point is actually the same point in the real world. And this is an important information that we're going to, that we're going to explore several times in the remaining part of that course here. So uh, the fundamental matrix is a matrix that fulfills this equation for all corresponding points. So whenever I have corresponding points in the image, this equation must hold. Of course, under the assumption that I um, have uh, op estimated those points um, perfectly so that there's no noise in the process. So in reality, you may not bring it down to zero, but to small values, um, just to keep that in mind. This assumes that we can perfectly measure the coordinates of our point. And so what is also worth mentioning is that the fundamental matrix is the matrix that contains all the information about the relative orientation of two images from an uncalibrated camera. So this means it has this seven degrees of freedom. So seven parameters are in there, seven free parameters, um, because it was this 22 minus 15, which are gone for the projective transform, seven remaining. And so this matrix F has seven degrees of freedom. So the question is now, once we have this, uh, we have our projection matrices, can we actually obtain, compute the fundamental matrix directly? So if we know the um, calibration matrix, the rotation matrix, and the translation vector, obviously we can directly compute the fundamental matrix just by um, building up the individual matrices and multiplying them with each other. But the question is now, can I also go from the projection matrices directly to the fundamental matrix? Just as a reminder, these projection matrices where these uh, four by three uh, matrices describing the mapping X equals PX. And assuming we have P for both cameras, can we compute the fundamental matrix? So the relative orientation 
between the two cameras. And we can do this, we can actually do this in a way which is um, related to how we did this in the direct linear transform um, when we were going back and trying to extract um, the decomposing rotation matrix and translation matrix. So there's some similarity in here, but in some it's actually easier. So the matrix P is a four by three matrix consisting of one three by three matrix A and a three by one vector because it's three by four in sum. So what we have is this matrix P consisting of A, uh, matrix A and the vector A. And we can directly see that this three by three block over here is my matrix A, consists of the calibration matrix times the rotation matrix. And for the vector, it's a negative calibration matrix times the rotation matrix times the um, uh, projection center of my camera. And now if we look to this part over here, we see this matrix popping up over here and this matrix being here the same. So this is the matrix A. So if we invert this part, we can multiply it from the left hand side and directly get the projection center of my camera. And that's what I'm doing. I'm taking this matrix, I'm inverting this three by three matrix and multiplying it from left hand side to this equation. We can see, this can see over here, A inverse, A prime, gives me K R inverse times A, which is nothing else than minus R transpose K inverse K R X zero. And so K inverse K becomes the identity, R transpose R becomes the identity, so minus X um, O remains. So that means the projection center of one of the cameras is simply given by minus A prime inverse A. I can do exactly the same thing for my camera number two. And then I know that the the vector B, the baseline vector, is simply given by um, the difference between the two projection centers. So the, um, the vector from camera one to camera two is camera two minus the projection center of camera number one. Right? So this is done in a straightforward manner. So this gives me my baseline vector. And through A, I have K times R. And through this expression, I have the vector B, and this is enough to build up my essential matrix. So we have A given, we have B given, and this is my fundamental matrix. So I can just write it down as A inverse transpose times the skew symmetric matrix, which I generate from this vector B, times A double prime um, inverse uh, with my skew symmetric matrix as defined here. So I can directly compute the um, fundamental matrix based on the two projection matrices that I have. There's one thing I should note. The, there's a second definition of the fundamental matrix, um, which yields a constraint where, um, the, where everything is transposed. So if you, if you look to our coplanarity constraint as we defined it here, we could also transpose both equations. So it's a zero transpose gives zero, and I, exp I transpose the whole block over here. So that we would then get x, uh, x double prime transposed, t transposed x prime equals to zero. And this is an alternative definition, which is basically the fundamental matrix there is the transposed of the fundamental matrix. So especially if we have multiple camera systems and we compute the, the fundamental matrix from a camera IJ, this is, um, I could generate a second fundamental matrix, which is FJI transpose. And so that means there are two different definitions of the fundamental matrix which are out there. So the one that we used is basically F12 from camera one, camera two. And this is a standard one used in photogrammetry. There is, however, a very famous book, the Hartley Scissorman, the Bible on um, 3D geometry, um, which uses the opposite definition. So they define the fundamental matrix as F21, which is F12, so our definition transposed. So if you look into the um, Hartley Scissorman book, you need, and you look into the expressions containing the fundamental matrix, you need to make sure that the fundamental matrix is the transpose of the fundamental matrix that we have been using here in our definition, just kind of to keep that in mind, that there is a difference through the transposition operator. Okay, that was the fundamental matrix containing the parameters of the relative orientation for the uncalibrated camera. How does it look like for the calibrated camera? For the calibrated camera, 
this will lead us to the so-called essential matrix. And we can basically say the essential matrix is the fundamental matrix but for calibrated cameras. And then actually things become even a bit easier for the calibrated camera. Why is this relevant? Because most of the time we're actually using calibrated cameras. So we use approaches such as the calibration method of Tsang that uh, we have described also here in the course where we use the checkerboard pattern in order to calibrate a camera to estimate the calibration uh, matrix K4 camera. So we take every image, correct that image through the calibration matrix and then work with the calibrated camera. And this often simplifies our uh, orientation estimation problems because the calibration parameters are completely taken out in here. Again, assuming no um, distortions, uh, other distortions than the typical imaging errors um, that, that, that we described. So this calibration matrix with those five parameters in here. So what the um, calibrated camera and the coplanarity constraint together allows us um, leads to a more, slightly more simplified form. So again, based on the calibration matrix, we obtain the, the vectors in the camera coordinate system by inverting the, um, the calibration matrix. So in our, our calibrated camera kind of directly generates uh, the direction vectors in the frame of the camera. So that the mapping is actually simplified to that x equals px is k, or the regular expression is k times r, um, the projection matrix and the point, can be simplified to just the calibration matrix times the camera already uh, with our direction vector, so in the camera frame. So the mapping is basically the point in the camera frame times the calibration matrix gives me my image coordinate directly. And so this is something that we can directly exploit, that we basically have our points already here in this corrected form, in the calibrated form. So we can just start and take out the fundamental matrix and turn it directly into the essential matrix. So we start with x prime transposed f x double prime equals to zero. This was the basic equation that we had for the fundamental matrix. Then we just expand it according to the definition of the fundamental matrix. And then we can look to this expression, actually this expression over here, and this expression over here was exactly the direction vectors that we obtained before. So if we don't use our image coordinates from the uncalibrated camera, but from the calibrated camera, it replaces this whole expression over here. So this part is nothing else than x k double prime, and this part here is nothing else than x in the coordinate frame k prime um, transposed. So the pixel coordinate from the calibrated camera transposed and the pixel coordinate of the second camera both expressed in the camera frame. And then if I write it like this the part which remains in the middle becomes the essential matrix. So this in here is just the rotation matrix of camera 1, the skew symmetric matrix, the rotation matrix of camera 2 transposed it becomes then the essential matrix for as the fundamental matrix but just for the calibrated camera. So we can write down exactly the same constraint x prime transposed e x double prime equals to zero if we can express everything directly in the camera coordinate system or in the camera frame. So the essential matrix is nothing else than a special form of fundamental matrix, basically a fundamental matrix for the calibrated camera. And then things get easier because the calibration matrices basically go away and just the rotation matrix uh, and the screw symmetric matrix and the second rotation matrix actually survives this process and we can see here already that it only involves the rotational parameters and it only involves the baseline parameters. So in the end this will be a matrix which has five degrees of freedom because these are the five elements we can actually estimate um, just based on camera images because we cannot um, determine the similarity transform for the uh, absolute orientation. So the remaining relative one are the five degrees of freedom which will be encoded in this matrix E which is again a three by three matrix but only has five degrees of freedom in here. And we can use it in exactly the same way uh, as we used it for the, fu with the fundamental matrix to describe the coplanarity constraint. Uh, we use the essential matrix for the calibrated camera.
So the interchangeable matrix has, as I said, this five degrees of freedom. And these are the five degrees of freedom that we can actually estimate from the um, relative movement of the camera without knowing anything about the scene. And these are five because they are the remaining seven one of the 12 for the calibrated camera, um, which are taken by the similarity transform in order to compute the um, absolute orientation of the uh, photogrammetric model. And so we have this five degrees of freedom which are left. The essential matrix itself is a three by three matrix. Um, so it has nine elements, um, five parameters are taken. So it has four constraints. One of those constraints, for example, results from the fact that it's an homogeneous matrix. So again, one degree of freedom is gone for the scaling, but it has other constraints. For example, there are um, certain constraints on the uh, singular values that this matrix will have, something that we are going to exploit. And um, so the singular, uh, the essential matrix um, can be used to define the coplanarity constraint, uh, similar as the fundamental matrix um, did that for uh, the uncalibrated camera. So the essential matrix basically is the fundamental matrix for the calibrated camera. Um, before we come to the end, I would like to introduce the few popular representations that are out there in order to describe this relative orientation. So looking into what are typical parameterizations for that, because you can actually express things differently. Where's camera one um, with respect to camera two, for example, especially these five degrees of freedom. So how do we actually pr parameterize our essential matrix? How should that be done? And this depends on the parameterization, how in which I describe how camera two is related with respect to camera one. And we are basically looking in here to um, three popular parameterizations uh, which are out there to describe these five degrees of freedom. Um, so there are ways where um, one puts, or what all approaches do, they put the first camera into the center of the reference frame and then describe the second camera with respect to the first camera. This can be done by saying either this is um, a can be described by a rotation matrix, how camera two is basically looking with respect to camera number one um, and our baseline vector. And then the baseline vector is restricted to um, a certain length, for example, unit lengths or other approaches um, which are more traditional ones um, use um, on this, this baseline vector set one uh, parameter to a constant value so that only two degrees of freedom are left for, for example, the y and z coordinate or even a transformation which expresses the whole transformation only in terms of rotation and this kind of underlies in a nice way that the um, camera is actually um, uh, an orientation measurement device and that we can actually express everything with respect to orientations. So again, the first one, this one over here is so-called the general parameterization of dependent images and is by far the most frequently used one. So by today, this is typically the parameterization of your choice that you're typically taking. Then there's a so-called photogrammetric parameterization of dependent images. This is the one which sets one parameter to zero. So the Bx uh, to a constant. So this basically Bx, the offset in the x direction, um, which can lead to some mathematical problems, um, especially if you have zero movement along this direction between the two cameras. And then there's the parameterization with independent images, um, which doesn't take any distance information into account and basically tells how to rotate the second camera to look towards the first camera. I go along a unit vector and then how the second camera is rotated with respect to this. So there's also a way you can describe this. So um, the general parameterization uses a normalized direction vector B, so a vector B that has length one, that's kind of a key thing, and a rotation matrix. And this is basically how is camera two oriented with respect to camera one. And I get the direction vector with unit lengths because I don't know the scale. And again, this is the standard approach that we're doing. And in most of the cases, you will find this type of representation. The photogrammetric representation in contrast to this um, is also taking the orientation into account in exactly the same way. So how is camera two oriented with respect to camera one? But um, it has, uses two components, the y and the z component of the um, uh, base vector and, and sets x to a constant. So you basically have a constant movement in the x direction between all the, uh, between all the images. 
This was traditionally from the fact when you were flying, let's say, with an airplane, your camera looking downwards, making photos of the ground, and the airplane was moving in the x direction, typically with constant velocity. And this, we have this constant velocity in x, and then basically just describe the change in the y and the z coordinate. But whenever you have vehicles which move differently, this may be a disadvantage, and therefore um, this loses its... Um, its advantages. The, what's kind of nice compared to the first representation here, here I basically have six degrees of freedom and one additional constraint um, that B has unit lengths. Here I have five parameters and five degrees of freedom that I can freely set, but I run into numerical issues if actually Bx is zero because I only can compensate this by putting By and Bz to infinity, which is not a great idea in general. And then I have the um, the parameterization with independent images. We have rotation matrix one, rotation matrix two, and basically a fixed base, um, uh, a basis of fixed lengths of unit lengths in the direction where the uh, in the um, direction where the first rotation matrix basically rotates the coordinate system two, and I move basically in this direction, and then the uh, camera number two is the corresponding rotation in the other direction. Here I have six degrees of freedom in the rotation, and then I actually have a constraint because one of those rotations I actually cannot determine if I basically rotate both cameras in the same way, and therefore um, there's dependency between two of those variables. But again, the most important one is the parameterization of dependent images um, that is frequently used. And here, so the um, first uh, or the camera reference frame is defined by the first camera, so there is no rotation involved into the first camera. And um, because it's the uh, identity matrix, and then the rotation matrix of the relative orientation is simply the rotation matrix of the second camera. So then, then how is the second camera rotated with respect to the first camera? Because the uh, first camera rotation is the reference frame, and thus the identity matrix. And um, as a result of this, the um, uh, so is it actually the same for the for the first two parameterization? Uh, so for the general one as well as for the photogrammetric one. Uh, for the general one, um, I have the uh, constraint that the vector b must be of length 1, so six parameters and one constraint. So as a result of this, the um, essential matrix describing the uh, coplanarity constraint is now only the screw symmetric matrix b and the rotation matrix of the second camera transposed. So my essential matrix simplifies to this form because the first rotation matrix is the identity matrix. Um, so um, as a result of this, I have um, the Bx, Bby, Bz actor, which gives me B, the R matrix, and basically have this constraint that the uh, squared sum of the individual elements has lengths, is length 1. And again, the others have different constraints um, that we need to take into account, but I always only focused here on the general parameterization of dependent images because this is the most frequently used one and the others are much less popular. So I kind of sticked with this representation here for now. Um, and with this, I come to the end. So what we have discussed today is the parameters of image pairs. Um, looking here into the relative orientation, how can we describe the relative orientation of two cameras. Um, this has led us to the fundamental matrix for the uncalibrated camera, which we used to express the coplanarity constraint, um, x prime transposed f x double prime equals to zero. Um, and in the same way we did this for the uncalibrated camera, we can do this for the calibrated camera, which leads me to the essential matrix E, which I can informally say it's the fundamental matrix for the calibrated camera pair, which also allows me to express a coplanarity constraint, but now I have the matrix E instead of the matrix F involved, and these are here the uh, co image coordinates in the camera coordinate system. And then we briefly looked into different ways how I can actually um, describe or parameterize the relative orientation, so where this sits camera two with respect to camera one, and we looked um, very briefly only into this, and the most popular one is this general parameterization of dependent images um, that I briefly explained here, which has puts camera one into the center, of the coordinate system, and then the one rotation matrix tells me how is camera two oriented with respect to camera one. I have a direction vector between the those cameras, and there has a constraint that this direction vector, direction vector is of unit length. With this, I thank you very much for your attention, and if you want to dive deeper into this, I recommend the first and robust book uh, 
on photogrammetric computer vision. Here it would be chapter 12.2 if you want to dive more into the details or learn more about those parameterizations. Thank you very much for your attention.